We've got your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. This is Silver and Black Tonight on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Happy Tuesday, an eventful Tuesday in Raider Nation. Welcome back to Silver and Black Tonight here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Where do we start? There's so much to talk about tonight. Yes, we had a coaching change on the staff of the Raiders. We're going to talk about that with Vic Tafer of The Athletic coming up uh, at the top of the hour. Right now, we're going to talk stadium, Allegiant Stadium, of course. Last night, we saw a um, a, uh, a story about the stadium and a delay with the roof. So we we saw um, the fact that uh, the stadium roof, Chaz, will not be now completed until... May originally had been slated to um, go go up in November. Then it was December. Then it was later on. I think I have that right, but we'll we'll, we'll check because we have um, um, a guest coming up next. But uh, yeah, I think everybody's freaking out a little bit. I think uh, what we're here to do tonight is to say, hey, look, settle down. You don't have to get too crazy uh, with things. It's all going to work out just fine. But uh, we're going to get to the bottom of that and talk about it with uh, Rick Vallada from the Review Journal. So he's coming up. But how you doing tonight, Chess? All good, man. Great to be here. All right, man. Well, it's one of those things. We are also going to be um, uh, streaming live on video. So if you uh, usually join us that way, uh, we had some some issues there uh, at the beginning of the show, but we have corrected that. And we are now uh, live streaming on the interwebs, Facebook, YouTube, um, and Periscope, as well as the station, CBS Sports Radio 1140 or Sports Radio 1140, uh, up on that Twitter handle as well. All right. So, uh, again, Scott Brands and Chaz Osborne, and we want to get right to our guests because we have such a, a jam-packed show today uh, that we want to get right to it. And the first guest of the evening is our good friend, uh, Rick Vallada. Rick is, of course, business reporter over at the Las Vegas Review Journal, uh, and he wrote the story yesterday uh, confirming that what we'll hear in a report this week from uh, the Raiders and Stadco, which is the company set up to uh, build the stadium uh, for the Raiders and for the Las Vegas uh, Stadium Authority, uh, and he wrote that story about the delay. So Rick joins us now on our Newsmaker Line. How are you doing tonight, Rick? I'm doing great, Scott. Good to good to talk to you again. Yeah, keeping busy, I'm sure. Right, you got that. You got a lot of things moving. The MGM sale today. I mean, uh, there's there's never a boring day, right, in Las Vegas, especially when it comes to business news and all the growth that we're seeing around uh, Las Vegas, of course. Um, That's why we like Las Vegas. It's a it's a great news town. It sure is, and uh, yes. So let's jump in on um, the the stadium situation. So of course we had heard sort of some rumors about the roof, and and of course that that cable system, the cable system that raises the roof at Allegiant Stadium, is is the most intricate part of the project. So if anything was going to get delayed or happen, it was probably going to be with the roof. But just to set the facts straight. Um, why don't you start and kind of tell us exactly why it's delayed and when they, they feel like they're going to be able to resume the work to get it finished by what they've said now is May? Well, from the, from the very start, we, we've talked about how complicated this particular installation is. Um, Don Webb, the, the COO of the, the subsidiary that's building the, uh, the stadium, has fondly referred to it as a 12-acre Swiss watch. <laughs> and uh, I think that he's probably uh, under understating it a little bit because it's very complicated. Uh, part part of the problem is that uh, they haven't done too many of these uh, in in the United States. They've they've done some in in Europe, uh, so it's a little bit different than anything that anybody's ever seen before. But it's a signature feature of the stadium having this this translucent roof that um, that makes it appear like the game is outside. Uh, when in fact you're in air-conditioned comfort. Now, w- one of the things that they indicated uh, was that last summer they were hoping to get this thing installed, I think, as early as August. It got delayed to September, then October, then November, then December. And uh, finally, the uh, the indication is is that because they were not able to, uh, to, to install it uh, the way they wanted to, they've now uh, brought in five teams of engineers to uh, evaluate it and review it. And then um, uh, now they're they're indicating that uh, the installation would occur at at, uh, at its um, earliest mid-May, 
which I think for, for a lot of Raiders fans that you're, you're talking about are freaking out right now, <laughs> yeah. probably because it's so close to the opening date, which is July 31st. I think it's noteworthy that to, to mention that that July 31st date has not changed. They right. still anticipate they're going to have the stadium open on time uh, by that date, uh, regardless of these, uh, the, these issues that they've had with the roof. Yeah, and, and and that's the one thing that that I'll say, Rick, is there's been a lot of information out there, uh, and and of course there is a certain segment of the population, including folks in Oakland, who are angry that the team is leaving, who want things to go wrong. I don't think most people, even some people who were against the stadium, don't want things to go wrong because they know now that it's going to be done and it's happening that it's important that that get up and and be functional for not only the Raiders but for the community. So so that you understand, but with this project and with everything going along so quickly. Quickly, I think the, the biggest, and we've talked about this on the show, right, with you, Rick, which is this whole uh, uh, design-build process, which means things don't have to go in chronological order. So if the roof can't be finished, there are some risks, but it doesn't slow the project down. Now, let's talk about those risks. In your story, you talked about how because the roof won't be closed, as it was supposed to be by this time, um, the stadium internally will now be uh, subject to weather conditions that it might not have been. Uh, how worried are that, you know, we're going to get into our rainy season, if you want to call it that, we get four inches a year. But if you want to call it that, the rainy season uh, coming up here January into February, how concerned are they with damage happening internally, which will uh, maybe run costs up? Well, uh, one of the problems is that uh, because it's still exposed to the elements, um, it, it's possible that some of the, the finish work that they've done, in other words, some of the drywalling and some of the paint and all that uh, other, uh, those other things, they, they are still exposed to the elements. So, so therefore, they could get uh, ruined by any um, major storms. I, and, I, and I have to stress major because Still, a lot of the stadium, including the, uh, uh, the the concourse areas, are covered right now. So it's not like uh, there's a um, uh, any direct water coming in uh, to to most of the of the stadium surface area. And then the other part of it is that the uh, uh, the, the ground area that is going to be pretty well uh, completed anyway. So it's not going to be that big of a of a problem unless we get a, a deluge of of epic proportion. <laughs> and then, you know, it's one of those things that you just, you just never know. What, what's the weather going to do in Las Vegas? It's, uh, I, I've been living here long enough to, to remember a March uh, many years ago that it rained just about every single day. But then there are some times when you'll go months and months and months without seeing a cloud. So yeah. it, it, it just kind of depends on, on what happens. Right, and we, we had a very wet winter last year, and of course we got snow in February, and back then we had a lot of the conspiracy folks saying snow was going to delay it. It was like, come on. Uh, <laughs> but but not, that's not to say that you you take it lightly, because clearly that roof, everyone had known, and people that I know that work on the project have told me all along that if something was going to happen, and again, we're speaking with Rick Vallada of the Las Vegas Review-Journal, who wrote this story yesterday about the stadium roof delay. Um, but Rick, we, we, we've heard that all along. While we don't hear how everything else is going so well, the stadium is progressing at a, at a big pace, and I know the meeting is on Thursday, so we'll learn maybe some more from that report and hear what they have to say when they have to answer to the advisory board. Um, but that project's going really, really well. Also, something that, I, that I'm knocking on wood for, not because of John Gruden, but because the, the site has been has had such a great safety record as well, and that's a big deal with a project this size. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, proportionally, they are uh, way ahead of the average in terms of incidents that, uh, that could potentially be, um, you know, something that could hurt somebody. Um, so, a fantastic safety record that they've already put into place. The the other thing that uh, I think you you kind of uh, alluded to there is the the, the fact that uh, be, because there's been so much uh, work done uh, that is ahead of schedule, that's why they're able to to op- or, you know to predict an opening on July 31st as planned, because there were things that were uh, placed on the schedule that have been done out of sequence that have actually been performed. Uh, ahead of schedule. So th- that's the reason why, and that's why I think they have a lot of confidence that it's going to get done as planned. 
Right. Again, speaking with Rick Vallada of the Las Vegas Review Journal about uh, the story this week and concerning the delay of the stadium roof. Now, Rick, we know with with the project uh, and and from your work and what you wrote yesterday or last night that um, they're still on target, like you said, for July thirty first. Also, we know the first event is scheduled for August sixteenth, which we're assuming is the Raiders' third preseason game uh we've heard about sofi stadium in los angeles who's had an amazingly more difficult time building their stadium and having delays and cost overruns that are mind-boggling uh but but people have been asking why aren't they having why aren't they kicking off the stadium with a concert and it's because they're running up to that deadline is it right is it not and they want to make sure the raiders are in there for game number three well, you know, and the, the thing is, is the Raiders have been playing it pretty close to the vest in terms of what that first event is. I'm not sure it is going to be a preseason game. It mm. could be a concert, and uh, certainly that's something that um, they'll uh, announce in their own good time. Uh, but every indication is, is that uh, the two preseason games that are scheduled to be in the stadium uh, have not been uh, pushed back or pushed away in any in any way, shape, or form in terms of the scheduling. And if they have a, a, a concert on that uh, that opening date, uh, that'll kind of give them a, a shakedown before any football goes in there. So that's that's a good thing. That's a plus. And then the st- the, the season itself starts a little bit later than than I think it normally does. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, that that kind of gives them a little bit of a cushion, but not much. There's not much of a cushion there. And I think if uh, if if we all did a poll here, everybody would say, "Gee, we would rather have that that roof and." In, in place right now so that we can worry about other things leading up to the July 31st opening date. Sure, and then you get to work inside the stadium uh, without the, the, the issue of weather issues and, and having to maybe uh, fix items because and, – and moving with the finishing product, right? You That's what you talked about, drywall and things like that. It goes right. by very fast. Now, Rick, the, and, and the, there's no – go ahead. I was going to say, there's no doubt that, that as things get closer to the end, as is the case in just about every project – there are more workers that are brought in and uh, added shifts, things like that. So we're, we're likely to see the the pace of the construction actually pick up in these last few months leading up to the opening. Yeah, absolutely. And and Rick, the one thing too that, that and I've talked to a couple folks uh, associated with the project and and with the team. And I've been told numerous times, and I just want to check with you if you're hearing the same thing, there is no contingency plan. So there's no, there's no they're going to play in, in Oakland for a couple games if, if it, the stadium's not done, or they're going to play somewhere else. Uh, are you hearing the same thing? Well, well actually, they, they do have a contingency plan. Um, the, uh, the, the Raiders are you know, pretty, pretty smart in terms of uh, doing their due diligence and, and uh, watching out for any eventuality. They do have a lease uh, um, agreement in place that they could, I, I emphasize could, play at Oakland Alameda County Stadium again if uh, in this next year if they needed to. But um, that's something that uh, is not likely, and it certainly isn't something that uh, that the Raiders are planning for at this point. No, that that would not be. I mean, they. I, I know today, I'm sure you saw the pictures of the crane up in Alameda taking off the the facade, the letters and the logo of their yeah. their their headquarters up there. So they're they're ready to move to Las Vegas, even though that's not officially happening uh, fully until the team breaks <laughs> camp. March, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. in March, obviously, they'll have staff in that office building in Henderson, uh, which will be interesting. Uh, but but the meeting on Thursday, I've gotten a lot of um, direct messages and questions today in social media uh, because people knew I was going to talk to you. What do we expect Thursday? Are we going to expect any surprises Thursday? Or we kind of know where this is going to go? Uh, and based on that report and, and what you reported yesterday? I think that uh, most of the information is out there in the, in the reports. The only things that we might get are some additional details from, from Don Webb and from Mark Bedane if they uh, choose to elaborate any further on some of the, uh, some of the matters that have been brought up. Certainly with a, a nine-member uh, uh, convention, or it's convention, <laughs> <laughs> or stadium authority that, that's in place, they could ask questions and, and uh, pick the brains of these guys to, to, to kind of get some specific details. But I'm not expecting any big fireworks uh, in terms of any bombshell um, uh, announcements or events that are going to happen at that Thursday meeting, although that's why we go to the meetings. It's like right. playing the game. You know, you always go <laughs> because you never know what's going to happen. And certainly uh, uh, something that has uh, such wide-ranging interest in a number of different fans 
are are always going to to you know they're always going to be concerned about what the actions are that are being taken and uh, to make sure that uh, everything's in place the way they want them to be. Rick, in about the minute we have left, too, have you what's the, what's the latest you're hearing on the draft and location of all the draft festivities? Well, we we've reported uh, quite some time ago that uh, uh, all indications are that it would be at the Caesar's Forum uh, area uh, in the the Link Promenade uh, area. Uh, there's going to be a meeting next Tuesday of the uh, Clark County Commission at which they'll be talking about what streets are going to be closed down, and uh, we fully anticipate that parts of Flamingo Road are going to be closed down in order to accommodate uh, a, a draft festival, per se, at, uh, at the, the Link Promenade. There are other venues without, throughout uh, Las Vegas that are going to be playing some kind of a role in the, uh, in the draft festivities. So uh, all I can say is stay tuned on that. I, I don't believe that uh, Commissioner Goodell is going to make any big announcements when he speaks here Friday, but uh, we're also going to be listening in on that to see if he drops any hints on what uh, some of the details of that event in April are going to be. Yeah, that'll be really interesting. And uh, we appreciate all the work you've done on this, Rick, and will continue to do. Again, Rick Vallada from the Las Vegas Review-Journal. Make sure you follow him on t- Twitter. It is his name, at Rick, R-I-C-K-V-L-O-T-T-A. Uh, great job again, my friend, and we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, Scott. All right, Rick Vallada, there you go, Chaz. We're up to date. Yep. On what's going on with the stadium. No, it's not falling down. No, there's no conspiracy. It's not Capricorn one faking <laughs> so, the moon or the Mars landing. At this point, uh, it's it's pretty standard. It's rain just, would really be the the biggest hindrance, right? If you had torrential rains and issues that would create uh, problems in mm-hmm. there, and hey, it could happen. Doubtful. Four inches Doubtful. a year. Yes. Doubtful. Yeah. Doubtful. <laughs> As we say that. Storm clouds are brewing. (laughs) All right, so you're up to date on the stadium roof. We're going to step aside when we come back. We're going to go back out on the phones. We're going to talk about today's big news. Brenson Buckner, popular defensive line coach uh, who, in his first year with the Raiders, made great progress with that young defensive line. Uh, Vic Tafer from The Athletic will join us as we'll talk about Buckner being let go today. Uh, And, of course, Ron Marinelli, formerly the defensive coordinator of the Cowboys, taking his spot. You're listening to The Silver and Black Tonight here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Raider Nation rallies with us. This is Silver and Black Tonight on CBS Sports Radio 1140. All right, here we are back. And I misspoke, so I want to apologize to all of you out there. Vic is up after the next break. So, uh, yeah, you can curse me. You can do whatever you want uh, for, for teasing you there. They do that anyway. It's in the biz. It's called a tease. That's right. You know about teases, right? <laughs> I've been doing it my whole life. <laughs> All right. We are back. We're talking Raiders on, hey, Big Easy on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. We are on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope Live on video. Big Easy. Um, you want to tell everybody what you told me about your camera before the show? hey You said, put the camera so that it captures my good side. And <laughs> I said, out, Chaz, I said, all your sides are good sides, Ew. right? Yikes. All right, we're back. We're talking Raiders football. And again, coming up after the next break, Vic Tafer of The Athletic. And Vic is moving to Las Vegas. Yeah. He, Vegas, he made Vegas, the Vegas, announcement, perfect. so he's coming here. Uh, and uh, it's going to be an interesting conversation as we talk to him about the dismissal today of Raiders defensive line coach Brenson Buckner, yeah, a, a guy we had on this show. Yeah, and was fantastic. Coach just, Buck is great. I, you know, like we talked about on Sunday's show. You know, when when the team they're always to, uh, looking to improve um, players at every position at all time. I guess you know, same thing goes for coaches. Uh, if you can upgrade at a coaching position, you do it. And you know, this takes nothing away from from Coach Buckner and and who he is. You know, he's a great coach and he's an even better person. And I have no doubt that he'll land on his feet and and he'll be on another team next season. So, you know, just like, you know, with the players, you're always looking to upgrade. And and, uh, if you can bring somebody in that's going to take this young uh, core, you know, this young line to the next level, you've got to do that. Yeah, no, that that's true. And and Coach Buckner is not going to have any problem no. uh, finding work. And and it's one of those things, and we're gonna we're gonna save it for the conversation with Vic. One of those things where someone gets let go not because they didn't do a good job, right? So we wish him the best of luck and um, uh, just a fantastic guy. So one thing though, I want to talk about other news. We had so much news happen. I know it's a big day in the last twenty four hours, in the last few hours. 
uh, is the fact that uh, Josh Jacobs, yes, by uh, the organization that I'm a member of, the Professional Football Writers of America, the PFW, uh, and, and I did vote for him. Full disclosure, I'd be happy to tell you who else I voted for. Mm. Um, but uh, he was voted at the Offensive Rookie of the Year. Yes, which mm. a no brainer, right? Chaz? No brainer, I mean, really. what he did. Uh, he's well. I mean, the first Raider rookie to break a thousand yard mark. That was huge. He had five hundred yard games. Should have had six. Uh, he had ninety nine yards in that first Kansas City game. I remember I was texting with you during the game. I said, I don't care what they do, just get Josh Jacobs back in there for another <laughs> yard. And uh, but eighth in the league overall in rushing with uh, eleven hundred fifty yards. Uh, third in yards per game, eighty eight and a half uh, yards a game. But for me, just. Uh, watching Josh Jacobs run the ball is such a thrill. Like, and then finding out what kind of a person he is uh, off the field, um, knowing where he came from and what he's been through, just just makes it that much more enjoyable. No, it does. And again, Josh Jacobs, uh, we have a story up on silverandblacktoday.com. If you haven't gone to our website, if you listen to the radio show, watch us on video, yep. but you don't visit the website, go do it. We're having a huge day today there. The numbers, like my, the website will ping me on traffic numbers. And it's just like, holy moly. Uh, but there's a story up there. And in that, in the story about Josh Jacobs, I'm going to pull it up here in the studio. So give me like a Jeopardy theme or something there, Chess. No. Um, but what, what, if you look at this, the, the story on Josh Jacobs, what we did there too is we put in the rest of that team because he was joined, you know, some, some Raider fans really felt like he should be uh, the rookie of the year in general. That honor uh, went to Joey Bosa right. from the 49ers, Nick which Bosa? I think is, I mean, I, I think is uh, very, very deserved uh, for him to be able to uh, win that award yeah. as well. And you uh, vote on these. These are all b- voted right after the season ends before the playoffs start. Uh, correct. Right. So you're yes. not going to get anything because of, you know, Lamar Jackson not showing up. That's not going to hurt his MVP status. And then Nick Bosa, like you said. Yes. You know, I called him Joey like his brother. Joey. But yes, Nick. Yeah, Nick Bosa was uh, the defensive rookie of the year mm-hmm. and um, um, the the overall. overall rookie of the year, which I think is fair. Yeah. Other other people on the offensive side. Let's just stay with that a little bit, Chaz, just to, to for for the sake of conversation. Kyler Murray, uh, of course, is the the uh, the quarterback and offensive rookie team. I did vote for him as well. Mm-hmm. Running backs, of course, Jacobs and Miles Sanders from the Philadelphia Eagles, well deserving. Yep. Noah Fant of the Denver. For Broncos, yep. uh, tight end at center, Eric McCoy of the Saints, great season. Uh, and then Eaton Jennings, a Green Bay Packers at guard, as well as Dalton Reisner of the Broncos. Mm-hmm. Another good selection there from, from me. And then at tackle, Titus Howard of the Texans and Jawan Taylor of the Jaguars. On defense, defensive line, here's the one bone I have to pick. Yep. You have Josh Allen, you have Nick Bosa, of course, and you have Dexter Lawrence of the Giants, and you had Ed Oliver of the Bills. Where's Max Crosby? Where's Max Crosby? I mean, do you guys out there agree with me? Max Crosby? I, I voted for Max Crosby. Um, not because I cover the Raiders. I really believe... No, he was deserving. Yeah, I thought he was deserving because if you look at his numbers compared to some of the other guys, they're very comparable. Now, the Raiders' defense was so bad, though, I think that hurt him. Right. With um, the voters. There's also that, that East Coast bias you always hear about every year where, where most of the voters, you know, they don't get a chance to see the West Coast games. Now, that's, you know, you hear that more in basketball because of the late night games or, or what have you, but um, it still seems to ring true that, that the East Coast guys... There, maybe there's just more teams over. There's more people over there. What 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 have you? But um, they, that was a shame. Max definitely deserving. I, I'd like to see the votes. You know, the same thing with the with the Bosa and the um, Josh Jacobs. I'm, I'm sure that was really close for the overall rookie of the year. I'm sure that was you know like a 45, you know, I, 50 I vote kind of thing. I, you know, again, we when we vote, we vote online. So mm-hmm. so the the Professional Writers of America Association website. You go there, they tell us, you go and you vote, you go through its electronic vote. Right. Um, I think, I don't think it would have been that close because of, because of what the 49ers did overall. That's true. Not that that's fair on, no. based on individual performance, because I don't necessarily agree. To your same point with, with Max Crosby, the defense wasn't that great, and then, and then overall the, uh, the record wasn't that great. That, that, you know, if, there's a, if there's a discrepancy, that's, they always kind of, the tiebreaker would be the record, the team uh, overall. You know, if, say, um, Lamar Jackson didn't have the greatest season and it was kind of down to him and Russell Wilson they would say well who had the better record kind of thing oh yeah so um, that's probably what happened with Max but congratulations to Josh, Josh. Jacobs great uh, we're going to step aside this time I promise when we come back Vic Tafer from The Athletic will join us we'll ask him about today's dismissal of Breston Buckner and also what else is going on in Raiderdom you're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 
We've got your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. This is Silver and Black Tonight on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to an just a, a crazy busy... <laughs> My mic was on. Uh, crazy busy. Crazy busy. Crazy busy. Crazy Larry's. Crazy Larry. Uh, crazy busy Tuesday in the offseason, and there's Raider news everywhere. So we're here to talk about it. Uh, and, of course... Uh, we just talked earlier on with Rick Vellotta. He got you updated on the roof. The roof. The, the roof. roof. Okay. Fire. So I'm dating myself. But anyway, so you're up to date on the roof. Now, of course, the other big news besides Josh Jacobs winning offensive uh, rookie of the year through the professional uh, football writers of America uh, is that uh, Brenson Buckner is no longer the defensive line coach of the soon to be, I, I guess they're just the Raiders right the Raiders. now because they're they're vagabond. They're in between cities. They're like it's they the left definition the, of a Raider. They left their wife and they're going to move in with the girlfriend, but they got to sleep on Chaz's couch for a little while. So <laughs> they're just the Raiders. The other girlfriend's couch until March eighteenth. <laughs> until March eighteenth, when they become officially uh, the Raiders with the start of the new year. All right, we're going to go back out on the phones and we bring in our good friend who we haven't spoke to on the air, I believe, since we were in London, London. with him. That's right. Uh, and um, uh, for the Bears game against the Raiders at Tottenham Stadium. So we're bringing Vic Tafer. Vic, how you doing tonight? man keeping a little busy today yeah i'm doing good how you guys doing (laughs) good it was uh it was a busy day up there for you obviously lots of news breaking of course we'll start with the buckner uh dismissal today and it's one of those stories where first of all a a great great guy and i'll let you give some insight into that because you were around him all the time we were not but uh, when we talked to him on this show and had interactions with him just a, a high character guy really nice guy did a great job with that defensive line but in this case he's let go and he's fired not because he didn't do a good job, but because there was someone else John Gruden wanted to give the job to. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, they're bringing back. He's bringing his old friend Ron Marinelli, who was with him on the, uh, the Buccaneers staff. They won the Super Bowl together. So, um, yeah, I'm sure when John, John mentioned this, when he like was out of coaching and was waiting to come back at some point, he kind of only had a list going of his dream staff and guys who'd always have him. Uh, the red, uh, the red phone alert that he called, they'd, they'd come running. I'm sure Rod was on that list, and Rod was with the Cowboys the last uh, like six years, was defensive coordinator last year. They changed their staff, so he's out of a job. So I think when that happened, I think John didn't see nobody want him on, on this team. And unfortunately for, uh, for Buckner, uh, <laughs> this was a job that Rod was going to fill. So uh, unfortunate for, for, uh, for Benson. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things, too, and, and, and you saw, I think, Vic, um, because fans reach out to you a lot, uh, sometimes with nice things to say, something, sometimes <laughs> not nice things to say, but I think people were shocked by it, uh, but it, I think people forget, and fans especially, they forget that it's a business, and sometimes, you know, I worked in corporate America, and sometimes the CEO had somebody that they needed to slot in because they, they're from, the, you know, back in the day, and they're somebody they trust, and they want to get them into a role, and they just do that. that. That side of the business, these are the days when you hear that and see that, correct? Yeah, definitely. I was shocked. I, mean, I talked to Brentson. He was shocked, and he was uh he got yeah, so he missed a call from John, and he figured he'd call him back, and he had no idea what it was about, and then he uh, he loses his job. So yeah, definitely it was a shocking thing. I think um, he did a good job last year. Look at Max Crosby, a guy who's a fourth round pick, a you know, small school, he put some weight on, and learned uh, got a better his technique, and had yeah, double digit sacks last year. So that's definitely a big feather in, uh, in Benson's cap. Yep. Hey, Vic, it's Chaz. Uh, I got to tell you, I'm happy to hear you're coming to Vegas, man. You do an uh, incredible job, and Raider Nation is absolutely a better place with you uh, covering the team. So, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Definitely uh, feel like it's a nice uh, new chapter. I want to make sure and, and see how it goes. Yeah. Well, I know your daughter's the boss of the family. How's she taking the, uh, how's she taking the news? Yeah, it's, she's good. We're still going to work out some details. And it's kind of a weird <laughs> thing where there's going to be a lot of limbo because they're not going to move until probably the end of August after training camp. Camp right. will be in Napa. So it's not like anything is happening right away. So definitely some time to uh, smooth it out. things out. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you started a little buzz last week with the comment you weren't sure if Mike Mayock would be back after next season. And, you know, beside the fact that he, he hasn't done an interview in two months, has there been anything <laughs> that you've seen or heard personally that would lead us to believe that? Or was that just your comment being blown out of proportion? 
Well, I, you know, I learned I learned lessons. I definitely have to watch what I say. And yeah. that was in the mailbag. And people say, like, I love how the reaction was. It's clickbait. I'm trying to get, you know, attention. Right. It was like the 10th question in the mailbag. <laughs> which, you know, I mean, uh, uh, well, my wording was that they get along fine. I definitely, the thing with Antonio Brown left a little bit of a mark. And I wouldn't, uh, I think my wording was, I wouldn't be shocked. Like, I don't I think he was 100% back next year but all indications are he will be back i think they're, they're getting along fine but again i was i, I was I, at the time i was probably too honest when i said that um yeah i think i wrote that the job may not have been as great as he thought it was there's definitely some things i wrote this job that he wasn't ready for when he took it like it was his dream job and left you know the network thing which had a cushy gig there so i think he, you know he learned some things this past year but all, he's definitely going to the senior bowl next week here and john gruden right the shrine game practice today so all indications are he's back, he's fine. Um, so my mailbag thing got a little blown out of proportion. <laughs> yeah. but again, it's probably my fault for the wording. I should have uh, not as been uh, as honest as I was at that's, the moment. That's kind of how I figured it was, too, a little blown out of proportion. That is a tough job, though, for him coming there. But I, I think it's something he he would want to do. He wants to see that through. Now, I think he's just known as maybe the, the draft guru right now. But but uh, to take on a challenge like that, that's something I, I feel like Mike Mayock, you know, that's just his personality. That's the style. That's the thing he wants to do. And, and uh, I, I definitely see him being they, – they seem like they have a really good synergy, those two. And I see that being successful and long-term. So let's let's change the subject to, uh, to our favorite uh, lightning rod around here, Derek Carr. Now, do you think Coach Gruden, you know, not endorsing Carr, is, is that just his way of keeping Derek motivated? No, nah, I think it was an, I think it was an honest answer. I think you know, I think John gets in trouble sometimes for saying things that that don't come true. Or like you know, like we said they were going to trade Cooper and he was gone a week later. So sometimes things he says kind of come back to bite him pretty quickly. But I, I don't think he wanted to give you know Derek a, like a false sense of a hundred percent you know he's coming back. I think there's just a question mark there. I think uh, John didn't want to deal with that question at that point. And it's going to be a question he gets. All off season, like every appearance he makes at the Senior Bowl, if he's there at the Combine, this be the one of the bigger themes of the off season. So there's no reason to answer it, you know, two weeks ago. But I just think that um, I think it's complicated. I think Derek definitely was better in, in year two with John than he was in year one. There definitely were some issues. I think obviously the offense did not do well the last half of the season. A lot of that's on the receivers, but also. A lot of that you know, is on Derek also. So I think um, he's going to look at what's out there in the free agent market and look at the rookies in the draft. And uh, at that point, maybe he'll be better able to answer the question. Well, and Vic, I know we just talked about your mailbag and you being more careful with what you said. But in London, when we talked to you, you said you thought it was about 50-50. Now, that was early in the season. Of course, Derek had a nice little run there. And then, of course, the the, the last six games went the way they did. Um, are you still feeling that? I mean, to me, I look at it this way. It's like, look... We learned again today with the Buckner firing that with John Gruden, you should expect the unexpected, right? You just don't know what's going to happen sometimes. Uh, he keeps things close to the vest, and he does things sometimes that surprise us. And so you could see Derek Carr under center like I thought he's going to be and still think he will be. But you could also see them, if, a, if an opportunity comes up for them to go in a different direction and they like it, they could move on. You still see it that way? Yeah, I think the other thing about John is he also changes his mind a lot. He doesn't really <laughs> know what he's going to think a month from now, so I think that's also part of it. And with Derek and the quarterback situation, you can't really look at it and say there's an obvious better solution out there. There isn't someone out there, oh, that guy will definitely better than Derek Carr will be better next year. It's not, that's not there. You have to kind of, you know, kind of assume some things and kind of guesstimate what, what's going to happen. But there's not really a better option, a clear-cut better option right now, which is part of the issue, I think, for, for John and for Derek and the Raiders. So I think um, – he does keep it close to the vest. I think he probably hasn't decided yet. I think there definitely are some positives with Derek. Definitely, you mentioned he improved. They definitely did better jobs getting out of the pocket, making plays out of the pocket, scrambling a little bit more than he had in year one. Those are things they wanted him to do. So I think there's definitely rooms uh, you can see why John may want to keep the thing going. But then again, there are issues on the offense, but I think uh, some of them uh, go back to Derek. So I think that's just uh, – I think it's going to be a question mark um, for – at least two or three months, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, Vic Tafer of The Athletic, uh, soon to be The Athletic Las Vegas 
Because, yes, we have an athletic, of course, covers hockey already here in town. Um, now, Vic, we look at this team, and, of course, we're getting, we're getting into the stage. Uh, we just had the college football national championship last night where Raider fans were, were, were teasing themselves and torturing themselves about Joe Burrow. Uh, but uh, when you look at the team and, and the needs that the Raiders have going into this offseason, um, you know, we know the history of John Gruden, the fact that he loves offense, at least that's the, the, the conventional belief around things. But this team needs defensive help. Uh, where do you think right now, as it stands today, knowing what the draft looks like, the the amazing amount of talented wide receivers in that draft, uh, you, do you think the Raiders at this early stage, do you think they're going to do a mix of offense, defense, or do you think uh, it's going to be too much of, of, a, of a tease and, and unable to resist for John Gruden to grab some of those uh, offensive talent at the top of the draft? I think having the two picks at 12 and 19 gives you some flexibility. I think the it's such a deep draft of receiver. It's probably like six or seven guys who could or, or should go in the first round. So I think you can take one of those guys at 19 and, and maybe help yourself somewhere else at 12, maybe get the best defensive guy available. I mean, I think you need help all along the front seven. I think especially a linebacker. I mean, you clearly see watching the playoffs, there's some dynamic athletic linebackers who are applying for these teams that can a lot of plays. And the Raiders just don't have that. They haven't had it for a long time. And I know for yeah. some reason all these coaches that come and go – the solution always is to get a veteran guy who's kind of long in the tooth, and it hasn't worked. And I, gotta, I tell you, when today's news happened with Marinelli, my, my, my second and third thought was, oh, man, they're going to get Sean Lee. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of like a Raiders type move, a guy, you know, a veteran guy who's kind of a, not really welcome where he is now and kind of wants another shot somewhere else. So yeah. I mean, that would be a typical Raiders move, which I think would be the wrong move. I think there's uh, some good linebackers in this draft that can get early. I have an instant impact. Like Isaiah Simmons, you watched him last night. Um, the guy from Oklahoma is also very good. I think there's guys you can definitely plug in and really kind of spark the defense to uh, definitely uh, an immediate uh, fix. All right, Vic. Well, I know it's it's early in this off season. Of course, we had the spat of news today that you were always on top of, and we appreciate you spending the time with us, and we'll get you on real soon. And I, I hope hopefully you'll be in town at some point soon. I know you will be for the draft, so we'll see. If not before that, we'll see you, and we always appreciate you giving us the time. Yep. All right, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, All Vic. right. Vic Tafer of The Athletic, soon to be here in Las Vegas. Uh, so it was good to hear that. And, and you know, I, I think he's right. You know, the the – you just don't know. I mean, that's the thing with Gruden. You don't know what yeah. he's going to do. Right. And so we can all make all these guesses and talk about what needs to be done and what they need. But at the end of the day, as Vic said, and he's around it every day, mm -hmm. he changes his mind a lot, Chaz. Well, you keep you, you want to keep everything in-house, too. You don't give out information. Now, we talked to Jay Schrader <laughs> on uh, Sunday show, and Jay, Jay, Jay told us straight up that, you know, the coach will go out and say one thing and then come back to the locker room and say another thing. So... It's not like he's trying to use misdirection or anything like that, but they do they do give just a little bit uh, information and then keep the rest of themselves. Absolutely. All right, we're up against another break. When we come back, we're going to close out the show. Again, Nevada Wolfpack basketball coming up Ow. next against Wyoming, the Cowboys. We'll be right back. We'll be with Mo Moten after this break on Silver and Black tonight. Sound off with Silver and Black tonight on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here we go. The home stretch. Around the bend they go. The Chaz and I grew up going to Del Mar. The racetrack. Horses. Horses. Um, all right. We, we have a little bit of time left, and, and we had to get him in because he's our guy. He is our senior NFL columnist, and that, of course, is Mo Moten. Mo did a piece up on the website. If you have not read it, you're maybe one of the only people in the nation who hasn't, and I mean Raider Nation. Uh, so go do it, silverandblacktoday.com. Mo wrote about uh, free agent targets, and so we go out on the phone lines to Brooklyn, New York, which apparently is still there because Mo is with us. Hey, Mo. How's it going? Good, uh, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm swimming in news here. Luke Keeley <laughs> retires. Um, Prince and Buckner is fired. It, it's just one of those days. Okay. Um, but you, but you know, you you like me, uh, you know, studied journalism and all that. It, it's these are the days you live for. They're kind of a pain because it change. You don't expect it to come when it comes, but man, it gets your blood going, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm sitting in a barber shop and and I'm here and I just my phone starts blowing up and I'm wondering <laughs> what's going on. And I get out and I and I see the news and I'm just like, okay, well, it's going to be an interesting yeah. day on Twitter today, Fun. and it pretty much was. 
Yeah, and, and Coach Coach Buck, as we said all night, uh, great guy. And if you're just joining us, of course, he was let go because Gruden wants to hire Rod Marinelli. It wasn't because Buckner didn't do a good job. That's just sometimes how it works because it is a business, uh, and, and there's no more reason than that. But, okay, let's jump in, Mo. We got a little bit of time with you. Let's start with – we're going to talk about three – free agents that you mentioned one starting at linebacker which is a huge huge need and of course two big names out there Corey Littleton Joe Schobert but a guy that we want to talk about with you is who was you selected as your alternative option which I think is a more realistic option which is Devondre Campbell of the Falcons right and a lot of people don't talk about him because obviously the Falcons didn't do well this year a lot of, a lot of controversy about their defense the defense picked it up in the second half of the season didn't do well in the first half but under uh, Dan Quinn, uh, Devontae Campbell was kind of their chess piece in the front seven. They moved him around. He played inside, outside linebacker, defensive end, and strong safety. So this is a guy who's 6'4", 232, can move. And this is what the Raiders absolutely need, especially if a guy like Corey Littleton, who I think Kelly believes is not going to be available for the Raiders because he's going to cost a lot of money. I think Joe Schobert falls in that category as well. He's going to cost a lot. A guy like Devontae Campbell kind of flies under the radar, and the Raiders don't have to break the bank, so to speak, for him, and he could still fill a pretty good need. And people are wondering, can he cover tight ends? And the answer is yes. Four consecutive games of pass breakups, uh, sometimes one-on-one on tight ends, which is, which is, again, a factor the Raiders really need. So I think he's a guy that the Raiders should target in March. Hey, Mo, it's Chaz. I think the, the majority feels that the Raiders will draft a, a wide receiver with one of those two first-round picks. And you mentioned A.J. Green in your article, and, and I would be 100% on board with that signing. I think he still has value not only for production on the field, but also mentoring a young player. Well, was that your thinking with A.J. Green? Uh, absolutely, but I, I think the pushback comes, obviously, with the injury. He had a toe injury, he had, an ankle, he had ankle surgery, had a setback. I get that. Mm-hmm. But uh, if, you're, if you're assuming Derek Carr is going to be the quarterback in 2020, he does well with, with possession targets or big targets. And just look at the history. My, uh, going back to Devontae Adams in college, Michael Crabtree, possession receiver, Jared Cook, big target, Darren Waller, big target. The only problem with Darren Waller was that he didn't have a lot of touchdown production. So he's having A.J. Green there and give you the size, and he could be a red zone threat. So oh. uh, a lot of people are hung up on Robbie Anderson. I would pause on that because he wants $10 million annually. That's too much for me. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's top that's top twenty wide receiver money. I wouldn't pay that for Robbie. Again, we're be, we're joined by Mo Moten, our senior NFL columnist at SilverAndBlackToday.com, also contributor at Bleacher Report, where you can also see his great work on general NFL and fantasy as well. Now, one of the positions that is a big deal, Mo, that continues to be a big deal for the Raiders, even though they had this great. Um, um, uh, progress on the defensive line is edge rusher and a guy you brought up in your story to go along with Max Crosby and to go along with uh, Mayo and some of the other guys on the Raiders roster already is Mario Adson now of course we've talked about Ngukwe and we've talked about Fowler we talked about these guys but talk about why Mario Addison might be a better target and more attainable for Gruden and the Raiders Better target because uh, he actually played in the four three and three four defense. Ron Rivera had uh, pretty much switched over that switched over, but he mixed in some three four looks, so he can stand up and rush the passer from the nickel, and he can play with his hand in the, in the dirt. Now he had nine sacks in four consecutive seasons. He's going into his age thirty three uh, season, season, I believe. So probably less. He's going to cost a lot less on the market than a Fowler or Ngaku, who Raiders fans love because those are the big names. But you got to understand it's, <laughs> it's all about financials, too. It's all about money. Who can you afford? And do those players want to come to Vegas and play for the Raiders? Of course, fans think every player wants to play for the Raiders, but just not the case. Yeah, sometimes you have to go after who's available and at what cost. Yeah, and it's a lot about fit, not only, like you said, with system, the type of defense uh, that is run uh, with Paul Gunther's system, but also uh, feel, coach. I mean, there's all those things. Just like when you go, when the rest of us go for a regular job interview, you know, you get a feel for a place, and it might be great, and and everybody thinks now because it's Las Vegas and there's no state income tax that that's going to take care of everything, and that's just not the case. But, Mo, um, in in about the minute we have left with you, um, you look at the Raiders, and I said it today with the firing of Buckner. That with John Gruden and with what he does, and as Vic Tafer said earlier, changing his mind a lot, that you can never get comfortable or never expect one thing to happen because probably the opposite will happen. You think this offseason is going to be just like that? Expect the unexpected? It's John Gruden, so you have to <laughs> expect the unexpected. So I, Remainder fans ask me, what do you think John Gruden is going to do? I, I try to give a detailed response, but usually I end with, who knows? 
next time you're there. <laughs> That's right, and uh, so but it, it it's good fodder for us, uh, and 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 terrible for fans because they they seem to be twisting in the wind, and it's just mental torture sometimes mm-hmm. for them. But Mo, we'll have you real uh, on real soon here on the Sunday show, so we can spend some more time with you. But we appreciate it. Great, great piece on uh, possible free agent signings for the Ra- Raiders, so make sure you go read it at silverandblacktoday.com. Mo, have a great rest of your week, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Appreciate it. All right, that was Mo Moten, our senior NFL editor, or I should say columnist, at silverandblacktoday.com. And, Chaz, we got about a couple minutes left, but you know some of those names he mentioned, and we didn't get into all of them, which is why I invite people to go read it on the website, yep. but um, Kenyon Drake at running back, he mentioned. People will say, well, we have Josh Jacobs. Why do you need a running back? They do need another running back. They need somebody to spell Jacobs, but they also need that big back who can come in on third down and and pound it away as well. Yeah, I wanted to ask him about Richard and Washington. You know, they both had great moments during the season. Um, and I know he mentioned Kenyon Drake in, in his article, but you know, I'd love to see uh, DeAndre Washington back next season. He, you know, and these guys once they, they put on that Raider uniform, they, they just turn into instant fan favorites. Everybody wants to keep them. Yeah. Now there's, you know, there's a few guys that you like get rid of him. <laughs> but um, you know, keep a couple of these guys in house. They already know the system. They're already familiar with everybody. They, they've got a good little synergy going. Yeah. Instead of just keep bringing out outside guys in, I got like Washington. I, I'd like to see him stick around. Well, and we'll see what happens if, or or as you said on Sunday, you know, you're always looking to upgrade. So if yeah. if, if he's there and that's the best that they can get, uh, he's obviously solid. We've seen what he's been able to do as a Raider, mm-hmm. and he's done a good overall job, especially this year when when Jacobs was out and hurt. So we'll see what happens there. But man, we're done. No, holy moly, we uh, we're gonna roll. Remember, Nevada Wolfpack basketball. You and are coming up next against Wyoming. For Chaz Osborne, I am Scott Colbranson. You've been listening to the Silver and Black tonight. We'll talk to you Sunday, eight to ten a.m. on Silver and Black today. Take care. For Mark Bonilla, our engineer and producer, and for Chaz Osborne, I'm Scott Colbranson. We'll yeah. talk to you guys later. <laughs> Take care.